Hello, everyone. So today we're going to go ahead and begin our conversation on safety. So this is going to be a conversation that's going to take up most of about the next month. And I want to go ahead and uh, spend a day kind of emphasizing general picture. What is safety? Why should we care? What are some of the important features we're going to be talking about the rest of the next month? So I'm going to begin most of these safety lectures by bringing up examples of famous or even just relevant safety accidents. So I'm going to begin, since today is the big picture overview day of safety, talking about three of the more famous chemical accidents of the last 50 years. So let's go ahead and start with one of the more recent examples, which is the Tanjin chemical fires, which happened in Tanjin, uh, China in 2015. So this was a case where um, ammonium nitrate and other hazardous materials were being stored pretty much unsafely along the, uh, along the warehouses, along the docks. Now, it turned out that some of these were being stored under high temperature and rather compact conditions. And it turns out that when you do that, ammonium nitrate can catch fire. So some of you may know ammonium nitrate from ammonium nitrate fuel oil, or ANFO, which is essentially a fancy way of saying a cheap explosive. And that's pretty much what happened in China. And then it promptly spent about the next month with the port burning. All said and done, in between the direct explosions, the firefighting efforts, and the chemical fumes, about 173 people died. And this was largely due to the fact that uh, uh, the dangerous chemicals were being stored incorrectly. Now, one of the most famous examples, uh, industrial uh, chemistry uh, disasters of all times, is what's known as the Bhopal disaster. So this one occurred in Bhopal, India, where a uh, pesticide uh, plant was more or less using an old technique of making uh, pesticides, which used a lot of dangerous materials, that it wasn't exactly improving its technique or upgrading the factory due to the extra cost. Well, what ended up happening was the plant sprung a leak and rela released methyl isocyanate into the entire uh, surrounding area. So the low estimates of, uh, of deaths from the Bhopal disaster is about 4,000, which most estimates coming into the multiple thousands, tens of thousands levels, with reliable estimates somewhere around 10. And it's hard to actually quantify exactly how much damage was done by essentially a company that wasn't willing to upgrade its protocols just to save some cost and didn't truly evaluate how dangerous some of the chemicals it was working with. However, just to prove that large-scale chemical disasters don't just happen abroad, another famous example that happened relatively recently uh, occurred at the West uh, Fertilizer Company in West Texas in 2013, where again, they were working with tanks that stored ammonium nitrate, which again is used as a fertilizer. And again, due to improper storage conditions, large scale explosions that rocked the surrounding area took place, with again, 16 deaths in this case largely because it happened in a more rural area and not in an urban setting. So I do really wanna emphasize that while chemistry is a wonderful discipline, by its very nature, we tend to work with a lot of hazardous materials. And so you should try and take the hazards of the job very seriously. Now it's worth noting that most, is, uh, most chemical accidents aren't quite of this level, but it turns out that chemical accidents are actually fairly common. So the current rate of accidents in chemistry in the US occurs at about a rate of about 2% per annum. So a way to think about this is you tend to have roughly a 2 to 2.5 chance 
of having an accident every year. And it is worth noting that at a, uh, at a more local uh, level, these rates tend to be a little bit higher at things like public and private co uh, public colleges, where we have a lot of students with less experience coming through. And so it's worth noting, if you scale this up to kind of a Truman University level, this amounts to expect about one major incident every month. So we're uh, something where it's worth filing an accident report. Whether this is an acid burn, someone um, burning their hands on a hot plate, or just accidentally sticking yourself with a piece of glass. So on average, expect at least one person this year that you know, probably in this class, to have some sort of chemical accident. And so one of the big goals of this class is going to try and reduce these sort of numbers, especially because it is worth noting that we're looking at more or less one person in the college every month having an accident. But when you scale this up to a more national level, this is quite a problem for the chemical industry as a whole, because this amounts to about uh, <coughs> almost 18,000 injuries every year in, chemical, in the chemical industry. And at private institutions and colleges, this is at about 35 or 36,000. And at public colleges, you're looking at about 32,000 people being hurt every year. And one of the things that almost everybody agrees upon is most of these accidents are very preventable. They aren't inevitable. And so we're gonna be trying to teach you essentially a set of skills that can help reduce the, um, reduce the probability that the person who ends up being injured is you. So let's go ahead and focus on the major idea of why accidents happen. So a lot of, a lot of this has to do to a lack of safety in the lab setting. And most people agree that there's five major barriers to improving lab safety. The first of which is just that a lot of people think that it takes too much time to, uh, too much time or is too inconvenient to, uh, to implement proper safety protocols. And we've seen a lot of this in the last year of it isn't exactly inconvenient to wear a mask, but either because people say they don't have enough time to go ahead and find one, or that it's just really annoying to be wearing safety gear all the time. A lot of people don't. And so it's worth noting that it is indeed worth the time uh, and the extra inconvenience to more or less not have to end up in the hospital. And again, a lack of drive or encouragement to, uh, to conduct proper safety protocols. And again, we've seen the same thing in, in a lot of labs. A lot of people don't know what sort of safety implementations they should, be, uh, they should be using. So when people have been going back and forth of whether you should wear a mask, this is actually problematic. You should always be wearing a mask in public settings. Similarly, when you're in a lab, you should always be wearing eye protection. And again, someone has to take the lead of employing safety protocols. Hopefully in most of your labs, this will be your professors. But if there isn't a professor around, I really do hope that it's gonna be you. And again, one of the big things that's an easy trap for a lot of universities to fall into, and a lot of companies, is the, is the focus is more on what meets, uh, what meets the law, letter of the law, or what's essentially meeting the regulations, rather than focusing on what is actually going to make you more or less safe. And so I really want to encourage everybody to take some time, consider uh, whenever you're in lab, what, uh, what hazards are going to be present and what sort, of, um, what sort of measures can you do to correct uh, correct and minimize this ha uh, these hazards. And that's more or less going to be the focus of this unit of the class. So it is worth noting that this is also more or less the suggestion of the ACS. And the ACS has essentially emphasized four major principles of safety that can help reduce 
reduce the amount of hazards we encounter. Now, it is worth noting that because of the nature of chemistry, we are going to work with hazardous materials and we are going to work with, uh, with dangerous techniques such as, it turns out I'm going to have to boil some gas, uh, boil some, uh, some of my chemical samples. And some of these samples may even be flammable. But there's lots of things we can do to reduce the probability of an accident happening. So ACS was outlined four principles, which essentially make the acronym RAMP. First, make sure you recognize any hazards that are present in the lab. Next, go ahead and assess what the risks are of those hazards. So it's not enough for me to know that, say, uh, diethyl ether is a hazardous material. I need to know what kind of hazard it is and what's going to be uh, what specific problems it can encounter. So if I know I have diethyl ether, I know it's flammable. And so I know that I should try and minimize any of those risks by removing ignition sources. But it turns out no matter how much you try and minimize, uh, minimize risks that you know there are there, you can't prevent everything. So always prepare for something to go wrong. And so even if you do everything right, accidents will still happen. But if you're well prepared, it can be the difference in between going to the hospital or going to the morgue. So let's go ahead and talk about some of the most common causes of some of these accidents. So the first major cause we have to watch out for is simply failure to recognize what hazards are present and when you might be in a hazardous situation. So a great example of this was one of my uh, former teachers who had uh, just conducted a, uh, an organic purification and needed to analyze his sample the next day. So he went ahead and took his uh, extract, which was an organic solvent of unknown identity, and put it in a plastic bottle so he could uh, look at it the next day. Well, it's important to remember that organic, organic solvents tend to dissolve plastic. You know, like dissolves like and he promptly melted the bottle that his sample was in, which then ate through the bottle and melted the plastic shelf the bottle was on. And well, more or less, great problems were had by all. And all of this was simply because he forgot to recognize that organic solvents dissolve plastic. Similarly, it's also very easy to fail to assess what sort of risks might be involved in an activity, especially more mundane activities. When I was an undergraduate, I did a lot of lab cleanups after, uh, after lab events. So I'd come in and wipe down the counters after every uh, organic lab. However, what I kept forgetting is that students were often, uh, uh, often making, uh, working with uh, glass pipettes, which tend to break the tips. And so I would keep sticking myself with the glass shards from their pipette tips. Again, entirely because I kept on failing to realize that even a simple activity like wiping down benches can be hazardous in a chem lab. And this also gives you the very important idea of, being of failing to be alert to what sort of surroundings are around you. So again, a great example of this was one student who was working with diethyl ether and forgot that the lab also contained a drying oven, flammable gas, ignition source. You can imagine how this turned out. So even though they may have, uh, their immediate surroundings may have been safe, the room may have not been safe for the activity they were doing. And again, this is one many of your instructors will harp on you. Make sure that when you're following instructions, you follow them exactly, and that you also follow exact proper protocols. So one of the famous examples of someone failing to do this is the example of Sangji, who is working at UCLA, brand, uh, brand new student, who is working with uh, T-butyl lithium which is a famous pyrophoric material, which means 
that it will essentially ignite when exposed to atmosphere, when exposed to water, pretty much whenever it wants. And she was doing this without wearing any PPE in a, sir in a syringe that wasn't rated for use with, uh, with uh, butyl lithium. And it ended up coming out the end of the syringe and she caught on fire and died 17 days later. So this happened in 2008. And we're gonna talk about this example later because this is one of the reasons why many universities have classes like this, is to make students aware of what the risks and hazards are of working in a chemical lab to try and reduce the probability of something, someone ending up just like Sangji. So again, this is also related to the idea of making sure that you know your own knowledge of uh, your own limits. And it turns out that when Sangji caught herself on fire, this was only the second time that she used n lithium and had, gra uh, had only been on the job for less than six months. She was doing a task that she shouldn't have been doing on her own or unsupervised. Similarly, and this is a very important one, I don't want to foster any sort of indifferent attitude towards safety. And it's very easy for complacence to breed contempt. And a great example of this was a grad student I knew who'd been working in the lab for several years. And one of their protocols was to do an extraction using sulfuric acid that they, run, uh, that they ran through a series of lines. So at the end of the day, lab work was done. All she had to do was close the valves on the sulfuric acid line. The valve promptly broke. She shot acid into her face and she wasn't even wearing uh, goggles at the point because it was the end of the day. All I had to do was close the line. She was very lucky to maintain her, uh, maintain her vision and she still bears scars to this day. So please, please make sure that you're always aware that even simple activities can be dangerous. And, and don't forget about the dangers of an activity, even if you've done it endless times before. So here's some of the major dangers we have to watch out for. So let's go ahead and talk about big tools to try and reduce danger. So the first one is, if there is a safer method or procedure for a, uh, for a protocol, please, please try and find it. An ounce of preve prevention is always worth a pound of the cure. Second, I cannot emphasize this enough, Make sure that you're always using the appropriate PPE. And we'll talk more about this towards the end of this, uh, this section of the class. And it's all about trying to build a safe laboratory environment. Try and remove uh, any hazardous materials from your surroundings and minimize the likelihood that, uh, that a dangerous uh, material or combination of materials might be present at once. And a good way to do this is essentially good housekeeping. If you've got a clean lab, you know exactly what's present and exactly where it's present, and you can minimize unintentional accidents. And uh, to go with this, try and make sure that all of your chemicals are labeled. I could tell you, I could uh, bore you with the endless number of stories of somebody who decided that they needed to clean off that um, glass of clear colorless liquid that was sitting on the counter, threw it in the uh, threw it in the sink, and it exploded, ignited, ate through the sink. The list is actually goes on quite a while. So even if it is water, make sure that you label it, simply because sometimes it won't be. And this brings us to the last idea of make sure you properly dispose all of your chemicals. Because again, you never know what sort of chemicals you're working with and Lord knows you don't know what sort of interactions they're gonna have. So this is more or less the end of our general overview. 
Over the next several lectures, we're going to be talking a lot about how to recognize major hazards in the uh, uh, that might be present in the chemical lab. And then towards the end of the section, we'll start talking about ways to reduce those sort of dangers. We're going to only be hitting the major highlights and speaking a lot in generalities because a lot of these specific dangers will relate to exactly what you're doing and what sort of lab you're in. So until next time, take care.